um, for this seminar, which is entitled Africa Reimagined. Uh, and I'm very grateful indeed for the support of our partners, Rhodes House and the Side Business School and the Oxford Africa Society um, to make this event happen. In, in my previous life, uh, I was an investor um, in Africa, working with investors um, in Africa. And one of the things which puzzled me was the apparent um, disconnect um, between uh, image and opportunity. And global investors just simply didn't imagine it as an investment priority. And I found that upsetting. Ultimately, of course, demographics should talk. Um, Nigeria, 206 million plus, Richard. Um, Ethiopia, 114 million. Uh, Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, north of 90. Nigeria, over 500 billion GDP. And yet a lot of the investors' mentality of Africa is, is denoted by South Africa, which is a population smaller than the UK, significantly smaller than Germany and France. And of course, the velocity of demographics is all moving in the right direction. Uh, there is a growing middle class, there's growing purchasing power. So uh, this disconnect is curious. And the question we're asking today is, is it possible that one of the reasons uh, why there is this perceptual gap um, might be that there is just insufficient academic engagement within Africa of the issues of Africa. And where there is uh, inattention, there's also the possibility of uh, avoiding or not, not finding solutions to problems. So to start this debate, um, there will be no better person than um, Professor Richard Joseph, um, sometime um, of Northwestern University, now of the Brookings Institute, who studied here as a Rhodes Scholar He's proud to call himself a scholar activist. Um, as a scholar, his first book challenged orthodoxies um, on the colonial history of the Cameroons. He then migrated to Nigerian history via Ghanaian interlude. Um, and uh, in terms of Nigeria, he's famous for coining the um, word prebendalism um, to donate to denote the rotational and corrupt politics which emerged in the Second Republic. As an activist, he was um, engaged passionately in the US civil rights movement, in the Deep South, and is still engaged in African issues with that same passion. So we were proud to elect him an honorary fellow of New College, and we're very pleased to see him, see him here today. Um, joining uh, us today, um, and I hope on the screen um, in a second, is Patrick Ogigpo. Yeah, okay. He's there, Patrick. Yeah. There you are. A little bit of a postage stamp, but um, a big presence nonetheless. Um, he's online from uh, um, South Carolina. And, and Patrick is a very distinguished uh, Nigerian entrepreneur, um, thinker, and commentator. Um, he set up his own consultancy firm, um, Next Year, um, and uh, that's based in Abuja. He's passionately interested in development, uh, particularly professional development, and what aids and impedes it. And Patrick, we're so grateful for you being um, with us um, this afternoon. Uh, now, uh, we're in Oxford, so the future belongs to the generation um, who are actually here. Uh, and I'm very pleased indeed to welcome um, uh, Godwin Nwangali. He's also a Rhodes Scholar. He's an engineer. Um, he's studying for his DPhil. He's a budding entrepreneur in renewable energy. Um, and uh, he organized the last Oxford Africa conference. Uh, and finally, um, uh, a cake baked at home, as they say, um, Chibugo Okafor, um, who is uh, of New College. Um, she came here to study uh, her MBA at the Side Business School. She is also um, an entrepreneur and she's been helping me generally on all sorts of things, but not least this conference. So thank you, Chi. Um, well, uh, we'll now hand over to Richard and we all look forward very much, Richard, to hearing your thoughts on Africa Reimagined. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for coming to take part in this uh, conversation. Um, I want to extend my profound uh, 
gratitude to Warden uh, Miles Young, uh, to Mark Curtis, who just came in <laughs> at the door in his moment, uh, to Jonathan Rubery, who has handled so much having to do with this event, and of course, many other persons that I would not know. I do extend my uh, thanks to them. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Patrick Okibo is, uh, is joining us. Um, Chi Okafo, who I've been <laughs> in conversation with, and then this young man here, uh, Godwin Nwangeli. So uh, uh, he couldn't ask for, for more and better. Thank you. Uh, hundreds of Rhodes Scholars and their family members are arriving in Oxford this week for the celebration of Rhodes Trust's 120th anniversary. The topic of today's event, Africa Reimagined, mirrors the motto of the celebration, Rhodes Reimagined. <laughs> I don't know how they both <laughs> picked the same uh, topic, but we, we accept it. I came up to New College, as was said, as American Rhodes Scholar in 1966, and in January 1968, began the study of African politics under the supervision of Thomas Hodgkin of Balliol College. You'll see Thomas and myself leading against the wall there at uh, Crab Mill, his home, I believe. And then we have his daughter, Elizabeth, here um, um, with us. Um, and uh, is, did Sarah arrive? Whoa, OK. <laughs> Wonderful. And is that your brother? Okay, that is your, yes. Thank you, wonderful. Well, um, Sarah is the daughter of, uh, I have, you know, I had many great teachers here at Oxford, but I had two great mentors, and David Goldie was one of them, and Alex Duncan just introduced himself a little while ago um, as another uh, student of uh, David Goldie. Uh, today, the imperial and colonial experiences of Africa are subjected to more critical analysis than ever. An Oxford University and colonialism project is underway. Africa's post-colonial experiences should also be included in this critical review. The Rhodes Trust owes its origins to the imperial exploits of its founder, Cecil Rhodes. I am connected to this legacy as a Rhodes Scholar but also as a former British colonial subject. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago and emigrated to the United States in 1958 at age 13. This is an age of global reckoning and transformation. Just days ago, I learned that a France Cameroon historical commission is examining why the end of colonial rule in Cameroon involved such violent conflict. This was the exact topic of my postgraduate research at New Annuffield Colleges a half century ago. Nigeria is the second African country on which I conducted fundamental research. Its annual Democracy Day was observed two weeks ago on June 12th. That event marks the annulment by a military government of the election of Moshud Abiola as a civilian president in 1993. This annulment was followed by the brutal dictatorship of General Sani Abacha, 1993 to 1998, and Abiola's death while incarcerated. On 29 May 2023, 25 years later, Bola Ahmed Tenubu was installed as president of Nigeria after contentious elections. So far, constitutional guidelines have been observed in the conduct of appeals. Tenubu was duly inaugurated along with federal legislators on May 29th, followed by the inauguration of new administrations at the state level. Now, this is obviously a very hopeful uh, development, and of course, it marks uh, 24 years um, of continuous constitutional government uh, in Nigeria many times that of previous republics. Yet the challenges confronting Cameroon and Nigeria and many other African countries are daunting. As Patrick Okibo, there's probably <laughs> few people, you know, better equipped to talk about this because the next year he has created, co-founded, um, prov provides uh, many very significant reports monitoring a lot of these developments. 
So two key questions today following from the warden. One, why have the aspirations for the African continent differed so much from the outcomes after colonial rule gave way to sovereign governments? Second, what are appropriate academic responses to these dilemmas? Um, in my presentation, I will talk about general responses, identifying what I see as some key issues, obviously not exhaustively. And then following uh, the discussions, um, the warden is going to give me some time to say a word about a project I've been thinking about for some time. Instead of life more abundant, by we say we say this was from the uh, independence leaders, so it's really uh, Obafemi Awolowo of Nigeria, um, you know, to whom uh, uh, it is usually credited. Life more abundant. So the continent's progress, as stated in the announcement of this event, is overshadowed by, quote, entrenched autocracies, militant Islamism, military coups, domestic warfare, forced migration, and the morphing of external intervention. I'm sure that most of you could take those six categories and put down some things that will fill them in. While advances in democracy and development are evident, such gains are often fragile and reversible. A popular uprising against a 30-year military dictatorship in Sudan in 2019 devolved into warfare between its national army and a powerful militia. In Ethiopia, during the transition from an autocratic regime that made some important economic gains, a clash between factions of the regime deteriorated into devastating warfare. As in Sudan, many deaths, injuries, and humanitarian catastrophes followed. As a fellow of the Carter Center, I was involved in peace and democracy initiatives in both countries three decades ago. And prior to that, I also, my first teaching in Africa was at the University of Khartoum. Hafsat Abiola, daughter of the martyred Moshud Abiola, and herself a prominent political and social activist, contends, quote, the African state system we have adopted by and large is poorly suited to our society. How do we get better performing government, she asks. And she answers, we must begin with the design. Who will redesign the post-colonial entities in Africa? And how will the woes of new sovereign states, such as Eritrea and Sudan, be avoided? Now, these are issues of which I have written considerable amount. And you can just <laughs> Google me, and you will identify a number of them. Number of, of, you see a number of essays on Arch Library of Northwestern University and also a website created with my students um, and which is called africacli.org. I give credit to Ben Nober, a student who built that website. I have long contended that the academic community has a major role to play in addressing what Alex DeWall, a human rights scholar, might be known to many of you, called development in reverse. Ayo Olukotun, Professor Ayo Olukotun, who played an important role um, in Nigeria um, as a commentator on a lot of these issues. Unfortunately, um, he passed on January 4th of this year. But in his last uh, essay, um, he also used this extraordinary state. He calls it, what are we going to do about the misery of misgovernance? Um, I'm going to put up a map here because uh, in uh, 2003, just before I assumed a position at Northwestern University, I wrote what I called a, considered a very uh, sober essay. But when it was published, um, I had nothing to do with this. They produced a very dramatic slide. Now, hopefully, it will show up. Is it going to come on? All right. OK, I will proceed. When he comes up, he'll put it off for a moment so you will see it. The thing about this is it's very dramatic when it appeared. But if I had to, or anybody had to sketch a slide today based on what I'm saying, I don't think that it will be much different. 
Uh, they even have a hand here that looks like it might be my hand, but it had not my hand. I can tell you the truth. I've looked at it very closely. It doesn't have it, but it has the exact coloration of my hand. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we can I'll let him turn that off. Okay. Uh, do I just hit this to turn it off, or it just goes off? Thank you. All right, he'll do it. All right. Here are five elements of reimagining Africa. And remember the question is, what should be academic and policy resources? Where should they be invested? All right, I have five points. The first, and um, an anthropologist, um, Jamaican anthropologist uh, at Harvard, um, Orlando Patterson, he once wrote that Jamaica is no longer just in Jamaica. And today I would say Africa is no longer just in Africa. Indeed, the underperformance of governments and other institutions has resulted in many of its dynamic youth scampering, and this was Olukotun's phrase, scampering out of their countries because they do not see a future for themselves there. In overseas, in their new countries, they can be seen rising in numerous possessions, possess professions. Of course, we have uh, Chio Kafo here and Godwin Nwangele, uh, just a demonstration of this extraordinary uh, Nigerian wave that the world has to get used to. They demonstrate high achievement and social entrepreneurship of their generation. Two, education. Of course, education, look at where we are. But where is education in many parts of the continent? There are well over 13 million out of school children in Nigeria. Um, I came across this figure when I was interviewed, uh, this Toya Falola, Professor Toya Falola interview, and that was in March of last year. Um, and there were various estimates. No one knows for sure. And perhaps the number is even more. In fact, there are more out of school children than there are people in some African countries. Nicholas Kristof will be known to many of you, the New York Times journalist, in an essay that he published not too long ago on Sierra Leone and education, he mentioned 75% of Nigerian school children age 7 to 14 cannot read a simple sentence. And Kristof has done that. He did it most recently in Mississippi, where he was talking about gains in uh, in education, and of course, I have a experience in Mississippi. And what he does, he has a simple sentence, and he just does his own test. He just shows it to kids and see, can you read the sentence, yeah. all right? Yeah. So what are we talking about here? We're saying that there are this extraordinary number of out of school children, but we're also saying that even children who go to school are really not getting the skills and so on to have the basic literacy they will need, especially in our age. And this in the largest and most well-resourced nation, as the warden has mentioned. So we have governments that are not ensuring the acquisition of basic learning skills for their citizens. I call this phenomenon a continental drift. And the continental drift is that the life prospects of youths who leave Africa by whatever route is drifting apart from the many left behind. And of course, he, you know, with the, uh, the three member, Nigerian members of the panelists here, I really don't need to say any more. <laughs> Third, on access to knowledge and collaborative learning. These are essential for addressing these challenges. A universal right to education must be ensured for all African children. Again, I said, you know, I got to know Chief Obafemi Awolowo very closely when he was campaigning for president of Nigeria, traveled around and so on. But um, as you, many people here would know his call and his program, others did, but he was a real lead on this, right? For free education at all levels. And we're certainly fallen far back from that. It is now recognized that the extraordinary African artworks displayed overseas in museums and personal collections must be made accessible to citizens in their countries of origin. Much attention has been devoted to the Benin bronzes from the raid of 1897 in that. But 
How about the knowledge constructed about Africa over centuries and that we have in our institution? How accessible is that knowledge? And even the construction of knowledge that is taking place. So from primary to university levels, we see educational opportunities stagnating on decaying. My colleague, Professor Ebenezer Obadere, in current history, a recent essay, he talks about you know, the decline and decay of the Nigerian system, one of the largest in the continent. Of course, I have a, a very proud association with that, uh, that, that system because I taught uh, for a number of years at the University of Ibadan. Two other symbiotic developments can be seen in Africa. And this gets a little bit academic, so bear with me. Uh, state fragmentation, on the one hand, and what I'd mentioned earlier about the morphing of external intervention. In January 2012, I wrote an essay when I was at the Brookings Institution on the band of insecurity between the Northwest and the Northeast of Africa. And this band dipping into Nigeria, and you could imagine it, has since widened and deepened. France, once the dominant external power in much of Western and equatorial Africa, has seen its presence, especially military, greatly diminished. While French and United Nations military missions are being pushed out, the geographical spaces evacuated are being filled by Islamist militant and Russian mercenary groups. Now, as you would recognize, I wrote the last sentence before the catastrophic events of the past weekend in Russia. What will become of the Wagner Group contingents in several countries in Western Equatorial Africa? What happens if the command and control of these heavily armed mercenaries evaporate? And as you know, these regimes are very closely tied uh, to the, these, these, these units, these mercenary groups, to the regimes in place and also to uh, natural resource extraction. So we got a huge question mark here. And again, you know, our scholars. I'll mention just a few scholars. Uh, Jeffrey Herbst, um, one of the best uh, books on, uh, on power and state in, uh, in Africa. Um, he wrote an essay in international security. Um, this is back in 1998. Um, and then I responded to it. And so we have this Herbst Joseph challenge. And while Jeffrey Herbst is saying that what to do, what is the response to state failure, um, and that he's proposed that stop propping them up with foreign aid, um, and look at how states emerged in Europe, and they emerged, you know, Charles Tilly, um, you know, war made the state, and the state makes war, so it's almost like this is a kind of inevitable process. Well, I responded to it that this is going to be the road to incredible catastrophes uh, in the continent. And in fact, uh, subsequent to that, Robert Cooper published his book, it's a very slight book, but very pointed, um, called The Breaking of Nations, Order and Chaos in the 21st Century. And I'm sad to say we are ourselves watching nations being broken um, and you know, raising the stakes. All right, this is the last point of my general comments. Efficacious governments have eluded much of post-colonial Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, we know him, uh, his statement, seek you first the political kingdom, and all things will be added unto you. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it has not turned out uh, that way. <laughs> In fact, I have, uh, I brought a book here by Edu Bohen, historian of Ghana, renowned, but I also work closely in, with Edu Bohen in the challenge to, to uh, Jerry Rawlings, uh, he stood up to Rawlings and, you know, helped pave the way. But I, I'm reading it because as he talks a lot about how a lot of the, the buildings and infrastructures and bridges and ports and so on were built in Ghana. Roger Meyerson of the University of Chicago um, is somebody who's been looking into this question and saying, why is it, looking at British colonialism, colonial rule, have you had these infrastructures that were created during that period, but their post-colonial successes were not able to match it? Right? And that's going to be just one part of our rethinking. Yes, you know, I'm a 
You can call me an anti-colonial scholar. I'm an anti-segregation, anti a lot of other things scholar. But I also know we have to go back and see what are some of the things that were accomplished then, yeah, right, yeah. that we have had for problems. Let me conclude this initial um, you know, part of it about efficacious governments. When I was doing my work on the transition to civilian rule in Nigeria, um, I, you know, the workings of Nigeria, because I was through my students, through traveling around, got to know. And I wrote two essays, um, apart from the study of the you know, political aspects of the transition. The first was Affluence and Underdevelopment, the Nigerian Experience, published right here, African Affairs, 1978. And the second one was Democracy, State, Class, and, 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 Demo and, and Prebendal Politics in Nigeria. And that's the first time I, I, I spoke publicly about Prebendal Politics. On the one hand, Affluence and Development was the recognition that the wealth of these countries were being siphoned upwards towards elites, as opposed to broadening uh, the development of their societies. And the notion of prebendalism has to do with recognizing the capture of state offices and the use of the resources of those offices to build up client networks and how this becomes self-fulfilling. The fact is that both of these represented for me a certain pyramid um, in the societies in terms of economic processes and in terms of political processes. And so part of the agenda in terms of efficacious governments, I thought, was you have to reverse that pyramid, right? Instead of everything being sucked up or mechanisms of tops and bottom. So let me stop there and hand it back over to the warden. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Richard. It's fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, Patrick, I'm going to plunge straight in and uh, ask you directly the question, how would you reimagine Africa if you had to? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thanks, uh, Richard Joseph, for your opening comments. Um, just to speak a little bit about you know, what Professor Joseph shared with us, um, and there's been a lot written about Africa uh, in a search to understand why we have pretty much underdeveloped or not performed at an optimal level. And you can take it from all the theories around colonialism and the generation that won independence for Africa and the generation that came after them. And I think that's where the work uh, Professor Joseph did on prebendalism, you know, kind of integrates uh, ethnic makeup uh, with the way we administered governance. And Leading on from there, what we had was at the emergence in most African countries of military rule. And you can look at the theories around how military rule destroyed the body or the nascent institutions that were beginning to take root. And ultimately, what happened was that as the military regimes were being pushed out, they replaced themselves with politicians who looked somewhat like them. You know, so politicians who were playing very close to the military were some of the guys who took over government as democratic um, rulers. And by that, many of the institutions that were beginning to take root from the independence era have also failed to take root. So what we have is a continued destruction of those institutions that should lead to development that should lead to economic growth, social economic progress. And ultimately, Africa, at least Nigeria, is stuck in somewhat of a, a vicious circle. And there's a recent book by uh, Charles Robertson that kind of breaks it down and says that some of the bigger issues we're having in Nigeria today is, uh, you know, high population growth or fertility rate, which impacts our ability to save and invest in industries. And he represents that with uh, electricity per capita and then um, our inability to invest in education, et cetera. And that's, you know, it's an interesting um, way to look at the challenges we face, but you can trace all of this from our colonial experience, our military experience, our destruction of institutions um, to our current state. But if I were to situate 
some of the challenges we face. I think I'll place it more around the corruption that has um, eaten deep into everything we do um, as the reason why we're unable to start. So it's this same corruption that affects our electoral process. It affects the people who get into um, positions of uh, authority, including in academia, um, in bureaucracy, in uh, civil society, et cetera. So what we're facing in Africa, at least Nigeria, is a perfect storm. It's, it's uh, a breakdown of many of the institutions that should actually help us emerge from the challenges we face. But I think that the solution lies in the confidence or in, in our ability to be confident enough to try things, to try for pragmatic solutions to the challenges we face. And I draw an example from, say, China. So if you look at what China has done in the last three decades, it's really a, a, a modern day miracle of exiting about a billion people from poverty. And this was not done because the red, uh, you know, big theories on how to drive development or that they became more capitalist or they became more communist. It was really a deep search on what are some of the things they need to do as a people to get themselves to develop. And they focused more on meritocracy, that irrespective of the ethnic divides in China, uh, the big, large populations they have, the massive corruption that exists in China, um, the poverty rate, that they're really going to focus on getting people who can deliver results into power. And by so doing, over the last three decades, China has been able to emerge from a really a very poor country back in the 1980s to one of the largest economies in the world. And I think that's where Africa needs to focus. There are a lot of things that divide us. There are a lot of things that we that ail us as a people. But we must find a way to entrench meritocracy. But more importantly, we must find the confidence to explore the challenges we face and come up with homegrown solutions to them. And I think that leads to the question Professor Joseph posed about, you know, who's going to design this new system. And I think it's Academia has a massive role to play here, although I must also contend or agree that academia has suffered the same fate that has befallen many institutions in, in the continent. But we must find a way where intellectuals or the intelligentsia um, engages quite actively in a search for solutions and has the confidence you know, to try things, to engage and not sit in the ivory tower, write the great papers and forget about it, but get involved in the governance process and take a hands-on, roll up your sleeves, engagement posture. And that has the confidence to say, we're gonna try things and if it doesn't work, we'll try something else until we find the answer. I'm not sure the answers are in the textbooks. I think the answers are in the streets and it will come from that robust engagement. I think as Moglu and Robinson call it, the narrow corridor, you know, where civil society and governance continues to interact until they find the answer. Unfortunately, civil society in Africa is also corrupted, um, but it's really to find people who are eager to engage, who are eager to continue to engage with the governance process until we find answers. And as we find those answers, we should have the confidence to scale them up in country and across the continent, you know, until we find some answers to the things that ail us. Let me stop at this point that I can take further questions. Uh, thank, thank, you, you. thank you very much. And I, I think your analogy to China really strikes home for me as someone who lived for, for 15 years in China. And the pragmatism was very evident. I, I always like the saying of Deng Xiaoping, that it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. Uh, right. And that uh, pragmatism does seem in a way to have been encouraged by the Chinese universities, which are actually very good in, in, in my experience and in, in very pragmatic in borrowing from other practices. So a lot of what I think Richard and you're saying goes back to universities. Um, in India, which doesn't have great universities, private universities are now being set up, financed by business. Um, but let me ask you a general question. What's your prescription for 
improving the secondary sector, even before one starts dealing with kids in education, basically, in Nigeria? So that's a, that's a really tough question. Education is a tough sector to kind of reform. Um, I, I tend to be more on the market side of things. And there's a great book um, by a professor, I think he's a vice chancellor at uh, Cambridge or some university, I forget. Um, you know, it's the title is The Beautiful Tree, and it talks about market solutions to delivering education to the poor. And what you find is in most African countries, government sees education as a social good that needs to be offered free of charge to at the primary and the secondary level. And then the university government pays for some, but there are also private universities. What we found from our experience is that every, most things that the government runs, you know, suffers from this same problem of where corruption eats deep into it, or the people are not, the, the teachers are not motivated enough or do not have the right incentives to deliver the kind of results um, that one would expect. And you, you see that the private sector uh, becomes uh, the, the key institution to deliver the education services in some of these countries, where you find that even the lower cadre in the, in the society send their kids to private schools when there could be a, pub, a free public school a, a, a around where they live. Um, so this book and my own uh, inclination um, supports for a bit of a private uh, or a market solution to education. And I know that it can get a bit tricky and I, we can get really into uh, how this works, but I find that government has consistently failed in being able to deliver education and the private sector has done better. And maybe if it's, it could be vouchers, a voucher system, it could be um, getting in private sector folks to manage the schools, uh, but whatever it is, it's to align the incentives of the owners of the school um, to those of the teachers and to those of the parents. And the government has failed repeatedly in achieving that balance. And I think the market system should be given a chance to uh, deliver those solutions. Thank you very much, Patrick. We'll come back to you in a moment, but I'd now like to um, ask Godwin um, to give his views. And, and, and Godwin, I mean, youth in, in Africa <clears throat> has made some major interventions in the last decade at, at various points in various countries, um, uh, in the recent presidential elections in Nigeria, in Senegal, in Guinea, in the, in, in the slightly less recent past. And one has a sense of a, a really alienated generation. Um, and I think research shows that uh, a lot of young Africans don't value education per se, um, as a, a, even as a principle, it's seen, it's seen as irrelevant. But you're part of that continental drift, so <laughs> how, how do you feel um, looking back? What's, what's, what's your view about these reimaginings? Yeah, yeah um, first I would like to thank um, you and the whole team for putting this together and listening to all the wise words mm -hmm. from um, Professor and uh, Patrick as well. I think mine is a very simple case because listening to them, I could literally feel my experience through all of this. You know, I schooled in Nigeria through um, primary and secondary school, and they were both private schools. And then I went to a government-owned university. And then after that, I started working in business for about three years. And then I was like, oh, maybe I need to go back to academia and do something else. Um, so it's a bit of like all of the worlds. Mm -hmm. and. Um, to that extent, I would like to just share what I feel about some of the things that they have said. So one of the first things that I've picked out from everything that you all said is that the system, as it is, is not working for Africa. And I think, in my opinion, there's a very simple reason for that. The, I mean, there are two reasons. One is you have a continent that already had its cultures, it had its values, it had its traditions, and then suddenly you had colonization come in, and that completely was an earthquake. It was like a tornado that changed the way everything kind of happened. Mm -hmm. I was having a very fascinating conversation with a professor at the Department of Engineering Sciences yesterday, and he asked a question, and the question was, is energy bad for Africa? <laughs> I mean, we've seen, I was in Nigeria, I've been to Port Harcourt a lot of times, and seen the kind of damage the oil has caused in that city. Mm -hmm. 
And then when he asked that question, I mean, the first reaction was going to be to be like, oh, what do you mean? Africa needs to develop. But then the second reaction and thinking back about what he said is, look, can Africa do this in the African way? Can we solve our own problems internally as opposed to going to copy whatever model it is that happened in the UK or in the US or in France or wherever and try to implement that in Africa? Now, the second thing I was going to say is when you said something about um, the military handing over to people that look like them, I think even more important is the fact that in the first democratic dispensations in Africa, the whites or the colonial masters handed over to people that looked like them. And that was what led to even the military coming in in the first place. It is rumored that the first elections in Nigeria were rigged, and then we had inept government, and that's how the military took over. So my dad was, at the time, um, you know, a youth in Nigeria when the civil war happened, and he would narrate all of these things almost firsthand, how he saw them. Now, the next issue I wanted to talk about was education, because that has now become the important issue of the day. But I think one thing that is critical is what exactly is education? Is education going to learn how to speak English and how to read sentences? Or is education learning how to solve practical problems in the society? I schooled in Nigeria, and all of the research I saw in the Department of Engineering Sciences between 2012 and 2017, there was almost none that looked into how to solve a simple, single solution in Nigeria. All of it was about talking about some random topic that someone read in some random paper coming out of some random university, and nothing was actually very targeted. So in my opinion, what I think we should do as a people, and especially as the generation coming up, is to start looking a bit more inwards. So what are those tiny things that you can do to actually change what this narrative is at the moment? The honest truth is we have lost our way, but we can find it back. And the only way that we can find it is if we start tracing back exactly where we came from. Look through our cultures. You know, you talk about education. Like, there was a time when we had things like town hall you know, sessions, like storytelling. Mm. And that was how the generations passed you know, information to, to the younger people. And we need to kind of reimagine those things, make them a bit more conventional, and use them to solve local problems within the society. Thank you so much for that. Um, you're an engineer, and, and one of the, in a way, positive cases in Africa has been digitalization. Um, and in a way, what you've just said is justified to some extent by the Kenyan experience, isn't it? Where, where Kenya set out to be a national digital economy, yep. rather like China did um, 30, 20 years previously, and has succeeded in building a, a rather distinct cashless society based on Kenyan needs. Could you talk a little bit about how you see the, the digital economy in Africa, in your view, developing? Is that a model, or are there other models? Or how, as an engineer, would you approach it? I, I think Africa does have a kind of the most significant opportunity now globally to leapfrog this digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of areas that this can happen. You talked about global payment systems. Mm -hmm. um, there's also areas in like renewable energy, mm -hmm. for instance, which I know Patrick is also a, a key expert in that sector. Mm -hmm. And education, for instance. A few weeks ago, I was speaking with Tunde Onakoya, convener of Chairs and Slums about how he goes basically to slums in Lagos, he picks up children that don't know how to read and write, mm -hmm. and he uses chess to teach them skills of how to become you know, stars in their own rights. And some of these children have gone on to start coding for global companies like mm -hmm. Google, for instance. So in that regard, I would say yes, 100%. Africa has got that opportunity. And I would use um, renewable energy, for instance, as a touch point for this. Um, a lot of the cities in Africa, and Nigeria for instance, northern Nigeria, a place like Sokoto, mm -hmm. Niger, has got incredible amount of land mm -hmm. and very little economic activity going on there. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a resource that is lying there um, and an opportunity yet untapped. Mm -hmm. However, the world now is moving towards you know, renewable energy. There's a lot of investment going into that space. Now, simple solutions like how do we tap into this incredible energy source that is currently wasting, you know, and turn that into opportunity that we can even export? For instance, some African countries like Namibia are currently looking at green hydrogen. 
investing about nine billion recently in trying to, you know, get that industry going. And you know, the giant of Africa, Nigeria, has been very silent. I don't even know if the Minister of Energy has any idea of what green hydrogen is at the moment. So for me, again, it's just, look, there are these simple opportunities that you can actually transform. And even in the area of like solar home systems, for instance, I mean, with $1,000, you can have a very good one kilowatt power system. Now, in a lot of cases, those systems are not even utilized optimally. Um, and that's why you see a lot of these solutions fail, because they are solved with the kind of Western lens. However, if you plan some of those grids to address the real African issues, and if you plan them to be able to share even that power, the same way Africa is known to share resources. Like I grew up knowing that, oh, everyone goes to a stream to fetch water, and everyone keeps that stream clean. If you have some solar system that everyone feels like it's a stream in their village where people can actually go in and get electricity, for instance, then you can now begin to build sustainable solutions. And that's exactly what Kenya did, for instance, with M-Pesa and trying to solve their financial problems locally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Miles, can I just have one word? Yeah. And this is, I just saw today, uh, the announcement that of a U.S.-Nigeria uh, energy security dialogue. And I think you need to get in touch with them. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. it's uh, always a danger when they have those kinds of announcements. But <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, they have a plan. <laughs> Gee, um, I, I'd like to talk uh, a bit about the role of, of women yeah. in the reimagined Nigeria. Yeah. And more and more women are entering the global workforce um, in so-called developing countries. Um, the involvement of, of women in the economy is a, is, is a clear success criteria. Yeah. Um, what's your take on women at this stage in Africa's yeah. reimagining? Thank you, Miles. Um, again, I just want to reiterate again how important it is we're having this discussion at uh, one of the greatest establishments uh, in the world. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the topic of Africa and its developments is something that uh, comes up quite frequently uh, in my adult years, much more than I'd prefer. And I think it's because of this reminder, as Dr. Kiba mentioned, of this sort of vicious cycle that we're in. Uh, as the founder of uh, the first and only EU uh, certified organic honey company in West Africa, I frequently find myself going back and forth to the continent. Actually, after the discussion, I'm on the next flight out. Um, and yes, I agree, it is... Uh, clearly riddled with its complexities, its very many issues. And I think if we sort of sit here and unravel it, then I probably won't make my flight uh, this evening. Um, but I think I would like to sort of focus or maybe proffer, you know, sort of a solution to these very many complexities. Um, I quite liked uh, uh, Professor Richard's speech, you know, incorporating that design thinking, uh, if you like, sort of the systems-based approach. So moving from military ruled institutions uh, and focusing more at, at sort of building systems uh, that work. Um, and bearing systems in mind, I believe the systems are unfavorable and or imbalanced uh, towards women. Um, and I think the solution lies there. So we're looking at what, what are the ways in which we can solve these issues within these corrupt or decayed systems and then also sort of moving forward. And I think that, you know, women already account for 41% in terms of business ownership uh, within the SME segment, um, and that is estimated to be worth $100 billion. Um, so working around these corrupted systems and, 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 and leveraging uh, the power that these women have. Now, delving into my sector, if you were all to join me uh, on my flight later, please feel free, um, and land in Africa, and you picked up a fruit or a vegetable, there is a 70% chance uh, that it was harvested or grown by a female farmer. But as you can imagine, due to gender inequalities, this decayed system, etc., these female farmers don't tend to f reap uh, the, the fruits of their labor. Uh, you know, statistics place a one to five ratio uh, from the flow of the dollar into the female's hand um, and the impact on uh, their family and their neighboring communities. So if we look at this and we say, are we giving these women equal opportunities to their male counterparts? What does that, what happens to Africa? Well, actually, you'll find that national productivity will increase by 2.5%. Uh, thereby lifting 100 to 150 million uh, people out of chronic hunger. 
So, you know, quite an integral role, I think, that they play uh, within these space. And of course, this is just a single industry. This is the agricultural space. So imagine if we kind of picked that up and, and looked at it on the macro level, again, going back to our systems uh, based approach to solution um, and really incorporating the other half. Well, actually, 51 percent uh, of, of Africa uh, uh, are female. So actually a bit more than than, than half um, and, and incorporating them into these systems. And, and what does that look like? So in the, the recent elections, actually, female representation within the political sort of sphere declined. Um, you know, out of the uh, candidates or general candidates that went up for uh, election, which were 15,000, which is uh, quite a few, um, only 1,500 of them were women. Uh, Nigeria ranks quite poorly uh, for the gender in the gender gap report recently uh, published by the World Economic Forum. They are a stalking 141 out of 146. Um, so really, really behind in that in that in that way. So what are some of the reasons? Um, yeah, at the academic level, we re again going on your point about uh, 13 million out of school. Uh, Professor Richard, you'll, you'll be surprised to know that over 50% of those out of school are young girls. Um, and this ties into, again, as I mentioned, the many complexities around social norms, uh, religious uh, uh, beliefs, etc., that prevent these young girls being incorporated into this system. And then the educational system. And then just, again, touching on one of your points uh, ar around uh, th this system, I think Dr. Okubo mentioned it, what, well, what is this system that the educational reform that we're talking about? Uh, this is a nation where I think the topic of history uh, was taken out of the, the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, in 2003. Well, how do you expect uh, you, you know, the, the youth to then understand what it is when you say colonialism um, and pre-colonialism, what that looked like? The storytelling aspect, how do they, they do that when within their own system they're not able to, 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 to study uh, history as a topic? Um, I, and again, as well, within politics, we understand uh, the, the, the social beliefs um, around uh, that encourage the violence against women who do come out um, as leaders in their respective space. And there is a great uh, stigma around uh, women who believe that they should be in leadership roles. So there is opportunity. Uh, Ivy country, um, there isn't that much manufacturing that's going on, and they need the leverage. They need to leverage off of the government. But as we've mentioned uh, earlier before, it is this corruption that is halting uh, the ability for entrepreneurs like myself to be able uh, to sort of scale up um, these very small businesses that I believe um, will sort of turn around uh, the economic situation in the nation. Thank you very much. At this point, I'm going to briefly ask Patrick, do you have any observations on what you've heard so far? Uh, I mean, I agree with um, all the points made. Um, I think the, the next question could be on the how, you know, how do we begin to unpack many of these things and how do we begin to look at uh, some of the solutions? Um, it's not all doom and gloom. I think there are some green spouts here and there. Um, Yes, the fuel subsidy removal, it's a bit of a challenge for businesses, but I think it's the right thing for us to do right now, you know, just given how much corruption um, that existed in that fuel subsidy regime. And so the, the fact that the, the new administration has had the, the conviction and the, the confidence and the boldness, you know, to take on that issue gives me hope. It gives me hope that they could also navigate some of the bigger um, reform issues we have to deal with. Um, it's never easy, uh, but, you know, it's just to keep engaging. It's to have the confidence to keep engaging. It's to have the confidence that I see in the younger generation who have started businesses um, to say that in spite of all, everything that's going wrong in the country, um, we'll keep looking for a way to make it work. And it's working. I mean, in the rots that we see as Nigeria, um, we still see a number of unicorns, you know, um, that have started in the country and uh, gaining some global, global uh, dominance. So I want to see more of that. I want to see more intellectuals engage. Um, and I, I want to see people try things, you know, try ideas. And if they don't work, let's try something else until we figure it out. Um, we have a, a bad history of colonialism. In, in Nigeria and so many other things that have happened, many other countries, you know, had their own terrible histories, but they, they had the confidence to engage and the confidence to look for solutions until they found a way um, out of their wilderness. Thank you Over. very much. I'm going to come back to you in, later, Richard, but maybe I can open um, 
to questions from the floor, um, from our panel. Yes, I, right at the, ba at the back and then more towards the front. We have a handheld microphone just for the people online, yep. so if I pass the that to you, that would be a help. In the green jacket, I think. Thank you. So I'll just stand. Um, good evening, everyone. Patrick, you, you made a reference to how, and I wanted to ask this question uh, related to governance, uh, because I think at the core of everything we've mentioned, I think it's governance that is the real big deal that we need to fix in Africa and particularly Nigeria. Now, my question is, is with reference to Nigeria. And when we say how, I, I, I look at history and um, before British intervention in Nigeria, for instance, look at the northern part of Nigeria. There were, I would say, very sophisticated systems of governance in place, which is one reason why colonialism or the uh, indirect rule system in the north was very easy because there were systems of governance that they just spoke to these people and everything worked, compared to, say, parts of the East. Now, I'm thinking when um, independence happened, we dropped all of these things, most of it, rather. And then specifically in 1973 or so, um, chiefs and all of these people were removed from governance in, in Africa under, I mean, 1976, under um, General Basanjo. Now, where I'm going to is, I think the system of governance in Nigeria doesn't reflect what the people want. And I'm not talking of the very high level, I'm talking of at the very grassroots level. Because most of the time we're talking subsidy or this thing, these very high level things. I'm, now how do we approach things at the very individual grassroots level? Which is where I think um, traditional rulers come into play. I mean, this is not something that many people would agree, but if you look at, for instance, Afrobarometer, the statistic says that more than half of the people on the continent trust their traditional rulers more than the politicians. So why all of a sudden do we not ascribe certain level of power of governance to these people and give everything to the politicians whom these people don't trust? Another example I'll give again, for instance, many of us here are Nigerians, if you look at, let's forget Abuja, let's forget Lagos, let's go to somewhere like Nansarawa. And in Nansarawa, let's go to somewhere like Lafia. A local government chairman in Lafia or chairwoman in Lafia, once she gets elected, will probably leave Lafia, leave her office there and go to Abuja and reside until the next election. But if you put it, for instance, a chief, I'm sorry I'm taking this long, but a chief, for instance, his power is tied to his seat, and he cannot leave that position to go anywhere. So by tradition, he has to sit there and govern. I'm just looking at these things and saying, is this something we need to explore? Is there a solution in this local system that many of us are just thinking, I don't know, I'm, this is just me just trying to ponder on something here, that is this something we can look out and explore? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, good to see you. Uh, it is an honor to be here. My name is Sonny Roche. I'm a 2022-2023 uh, senior academic uh, uh, fellow at the African Studies. Mm. The problem of Nigeria, which cuts across the continent, is total failure of leadership. 64 years after the British left Nigeria, we can't keep looking back at colonialism. Mm. India went through colonialism. Rwanda also had its own challenges. What are the routes to leadership in Africa? It's either military or politics. Leadership. The military ruled Nigeria for close to 30 years. I was a lecturer at the Nigerian Defense Academy, where you train officers. From a particular section of the country, the children of the elite enrolled in the military academy. I'm from the East Amibo. While I was there, I went home, tried to encourage young people to join the military for the discipline. You look at most American presidents' military background. Even here, Sanders, 
great gentlemen. But people from my side were either those who were dropouts that just went to the military. Then I left the military. I went into investment banking. Every investment banker felt he was God's gift to Nigeria. We don't discuss, we don't have any interest in governance. When you wear your pinstripe suit and your burgundy tie, white shirt, you have arrived. Then you left police. Students pay for marks. So, you know, so the whole system has collapsed. We have to go back to the foundation. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with uh, colonialism. We have Nigerians who've gone through the best institutions in the world, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge. But when you get back, you shy away and allow those who the tail to wag the head. It's just leadership, and we have to face it. Uh, I was in the power sector. I was almost killed for standing against vested interest. You know what I went through. But a tree cannot make a forest. I'm not being self-righteous. But we need the critical mass in government, in, 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 this, in the structure to make this change. It is not to be left to academics alone. It is about attitude and believing in your country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And then I saw on there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Ugo Eze. I'm a doctoral researcher from the Faculty of Law here in Oxford. Uh, I want to thank the panelists and the presenters for their very thought-provoking comments. Uh, so part of my research interests have to do with uh, the credibility of electoral processes on the continent. And uh, Professor Richard Joseph, you've written extensively uh, about the transition to democracy in 1979. Uh, incidentally, there's also very contentious uh, legal disputes uh, arising out of those elections. Uh, the current, there's been very interesting uh, contributions today about bold reforms. We expect the new administration to make bold reforms, but we also need to look at the crisis of legitimacy confronting the new administration. There is a heated legal dispute currently in the courts. Uh, the issues have been lit litigated. The electoral process itself is highly dysfunctional because if you do not resolve electoral litigation before the inauguration of a new president, that creates a whole range of complex legal and political issues. So I wondered if you would like to comment, uh, just to contrast your experience with the 1979 uh, democratic transition. I keep going back to that because part of the acrimony, the rancor, the bitterness arising out of those elections contributed to the, to the instability that rocked uh, the Second Republic, ultimately leading to its collapse via a military coup d'etat. So what implications do you see um, these protracted electoral disputes, uh, the crisis of legitimacy, illegitimate electoral processes, how will that affect uh, the sustainability of democracy in Nigeria and many other nascent democracies on the continent in the long term? Professor Richard Joseph, thank you. Well, well I, I thank you, sorry, but I, I thank you for your question. Uh, but, you know, we, we are very pressed for time here, and there's been a lot on the table. I just want to say very quickly, um, you know, in February, when I saw what was happening, um, I wrote a, a piece. It was published in the uh, Chicago Tribune, so you can just access that. Um, and it, they said, the, you know, the, the title has to do with, with Nigeria having to try to get its footing after contentious elections. Um, I did a second piece that uh, Professor um, Egoso Osage is going to be publishing um, um, in a report of the Nigeria Institute of International Affairs. And I am going to be taking up this issue um, of beyond contentious elections, right? Distinguishing that from competitive elections is fine. In the US, we have contentious election because it's made that way by certain characters in our political system. But, uh, you know, and so, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> All right? Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, any comments? Yes. Um, so I didn't get the name of the first speaker, but uh, I just want to say that I, I like the way he's thinking about these issues, but also to caution 
that um, those traditional institutions have also been compromised. Um, so if you look at the traditional institutions, the rulers, uh, today the governors can uh, instill, install or depose um, rulers. Um, so these rulers know uh, who, who's holding the, 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 the rope strings, and so they dance to that tune. Um, the same thing for uh, local government administrators. In many states in Nigeria, local government elections have not been held, and the governors appoint local government administrators who are basically um, cronies or uh, political jobbers who do what the government, the governor wants them to do. Um, and, and I'll come back with what I think is a solution. Uh, Augustoni Roche, uh, great to great to see you. Um, every time, every time I think of you, I remember a quote you gave at one of the sessions we had you as a panelist um, that there is no Nigerian way to fly a boy in seven four seven. You know, there's only one way to fly a boy in seven four seven. So um, I always remember that. Um, and, but just to agree with you that the system has collapsed, um, and but there is an there is an answer, and that answer is in. Um, active engagement. And that's the answer to the first speaker as well. It is in the active engagement of Nigerians, irrespective of all the issues that we've raised. Is it a broken system? Yes. Um, is it compromised? Yes. But many of the other countries, including the UK, you know, where this session is holding, you know, had elections that were, where the leaders did not have the, the legitimacy, but they walked through it, you know. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we should um, forget about the law cases that are, you know, currently against the current administration. I think the legal process should run its course. But if I was a betting man, I wouldn't put my money on the Nigerian legal system. But that shouldn't stop us from engaging. It is in that continuous engagement, despite all the frustration, despite all the issues that we're facing, that we'll begin to gain one or two wins here and there. And hopefully, in our lifetime, hopefully, you know, we will see a Nigeria that works. But we shouldn't discourage ourselves from engaging because it may or may not happen in our lifetime. You know, we should keep engaging because that is what we should do. And it's in that engagement that we'll find the answers. Over. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions or comments? Yes, the first, yes. Hello, uh, my name is Sasha. Um, I studied international relations, although I've finished a long time ago. Um, my question is why, uh, uh, it was sort of mentioned earlier in the talk, but why we don't ask each other questions, and by each other I mean other African countries. Um, the title of this talk is Reimagining Africa, and I understand that we have to be specific as academics when we're uh, giving uh, case studies, which is why Nigeria specifically is being discussed today, but we have 54 countries on the continent, not just one. Uh, we should be asking other governments what they're doing. Not all African countries have the a similar problem with uh, corruption. There are some African countries that have a very low uh, corruption index, like Mauritius, for example, Seychelles, Namibia was mentioned. Uh, there are also African countries that do not currently struggle with their education system, such as Rwanda, that has done a good job of actually uh, reducing the number of uh, private schools in its country. And uh, although there's a lot of military rule, some countries have managed to, um, you know, sort of avoid certain problems, such as Rwanda, again. Um, and also we haven't mentioned certain things such as the IMF and sanctions in certain countries, uh, like Zimbabwe, my country. Uh, once upon a time, we had a brilliant education system. The IMF came and told us to stop investing in our education system. And now here we are with problems. And then after that, sanctions. Uh, things like uh, the market and entrepreneurship are not going to work in a country with sanctions because nobody wants to really uh, take that risk of perhaps losing money. So I think we need to talk uh, more broadly about Africa, 54 countries, uh, rather than finding a solution from one. Um, because there, there are many things that others have done which we perhaps will find better inspiration from than looking at China, US, UK. Th these are countries with different contexts. And even India was mentioned uh, earlier. It has its own problems. It's got much larger population than the rest of us and so on and so forth. They, they've got their own conditions. Let's look at each of our 54 conditions and see how we can work together as one. I think, is, is that a possibility? And then I just wanted to add on the issue of traditional uh, leaders, to also say traditional healers. In South Africa, for example, they found ways to 
incorporate traditional healers to help campaign against uh, health problems as well as education problems. Um, because, you know, uh, in countries where we have high rates of illiteracy and you can't take a person to school to learn not to get themselves sick. <laughs> so they use the traditional healers to tell them what plants they can use to heal themselves and also to prevent certain diseases like HIV, using contraception and so on. Because those are also leaders or people who govern, if you like, that the local people trust instead of their politicians who they feel lie to them about diseases, that they feel are some conspiracy theory that was made in a lab, all these things. But they use those people's leadership to, to solve problems. So maybe this is something we can also tap into, I think. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, very much. Um, yes. Hello. Uh, thank you. I'm Kate Maher from the London School of Economics. And um, I just want to raise something that seems to me an unspoken elephant in the room, which is structural adjustment. We've been talking about colonialism and the failure of the colonial state, mm. but really there's a much more proximate problem with the state. The, the, the harm that was done by structural adjustment, which trashed social services, led to massive deindustrialization, intensified the, the levels of poverty, huge devaluation of the currencies. We're just getting a tiny taste of some of the interest rate rises and problems of inflation here. There's absolutely no comparison with what went on in Nigeria or most of Africa in the late 70s, early 80s. So I'm wondering when we're thinking about the problems of the state, if it might not be useful to think about the explicit institutional harm that was done not only by structural adjustment, but by the successive rounds of institutional reforms that have taken place since then, which were not the creation of African states of any sort, but templates imposed from outside, which have indeed exacerbated problems of corruption, et cetera, but are the exact opposite of African states trying to work out what African states want to do with African problems, but being uh, strong-armed into um, following templates that don't necessarily fit the situation, adopting institutions that don't necessarily work in an African context, um, dealing and with and allocating resources in ways that are unhelpful. And I absolutely agree with the previous speaker. Um, huge amounts of harm were done. And if you look at Nigeria in the 60s and 70s, it had universities that were so good that lecturers from Oxford, PhD students, and, and uh, um, people working at all levels of the university went and spent two years, three years working in uh, ABU, in Ibadan, in, in Suka. Nigerian universities were well known and they were dynamic, active places. So this is a, a reversal of fortunes, not just a slide from, from colonialism. And I think it might be useful to look at the ways in which, and I wish, I, I would like the speakers maybe to reflect on that, the way that African state institutions and social services have been altered explicitly by adjustment and whether addressing some of those issues, the institutional carnage, as uh, Jimmy Adeshina calls it, or maladjusted states as a result of structural adjustment, which is a term used by Tandikam Kandurire, to try to understand really what's gone wrong and where it's gone wrong in order to work out the kinds of solutions that can take us in a, in a better direction. Thank you. I'd really be interested to hear the speakers reflect on that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, just to provide um, some context to the, I think it was the first lady that spoke. Thank you so much for for that. Um, this is going to be a continuation, I think, of something that New College is doing, and we are focusing on different African countries. So I think today there was a particular focus on Nigeria, but it's going to be the subsequent uh, countries, and I completely agree with that point. Why are there not these discussions between different African countries who are doing well in some areas, um, or better in some other areas than other African countries, and looking at how to implement them, uh, you know, from the African context? Uh, you brought up Rwanda, Rwanda as well, doing very fantastic in terms of the political part of participation of women leaders as well, something that can be directly implemented uh, into Nigeria and looking at what are sort of the African cultural norms, the understandings, the religious beliefs that prevent uh, women 
entering into those spaces and kind of implementing that uh, into 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 Nigeria. And I think as well the the just uh, as you mentioned uh, about the structural adjustments, I completely agree um, with that. Sort of the again going back to your your point about uh, Godwin about uh, sort of this copy and paste method of picking up templates uh, from countries that you know, don't have the sort of same structures that we have in, in Nigeria and again, wider African countries uh, at the local level all the way sort of uh, to the, ma the macro level with uh, a lot of uh, the people. I think somebody mentioned uh, the gentleman over there earlier in his question that uh, the, he doesn't believe that the current government sort of reflects the wishes and, and the wants of the people. And I kind of sat back to think, oh, well, what are these wishes and wants? And I think that speaks volumes to the fact that the, the, those voices or the accessibility uh, to those people to be able to uh, put forward uh, their, their, their wants and their needs or proffer these solutions and incorporating that into you know, the government space and the political sphere uh, could be a way in which we could then uh, re either reverse um, uh, uh, these uh, structural adjustments that have deteriorated uh, these institutions. And you know, it's something that I see um, you know, within my, uh, and I'm sure others can probably speak to, to their own uh, experiences, but just in, within my own industry, uh, the uh, method that we have uh, within our business have uh, picked up. A lot of these international NGOs come into these spaces and they have you know, all of these great, wonderful 100-page uh, documents on how to fix a solution uh, you know, in a local rural community that they've probably never really had an experience of, but maybe they, it worked in India or Bangladesh or whatever, and they come in on a three to five tenure contract, really happy, ready to go, um, and you know, maybe they provide agricultural resources, they train these people, and sometimes financial capital, and then when they pick up and leave, you know, everything's back to square one. And what you leave behind is really super educated, well-informed rural farmers or whatever who have all this equipment and no, no way uh, to move it forward because they don't have the financial literacy. Uh, you know, you didn't take into consideration the uh, social barriers that they have that, that, that occur within their respective communities, uh, you know, the infrastructural bottlenecks, etc. So really, uh, we then uh, decided to take it, uh, an approach uh, where within our organization, we uh, leverage off of what these uh, international organizations are already doing um, but kind of really getting into the local communities and providing sort of that access to market for them to be able to be these well informed and, and, and uh, given resources um, to sort of better their, 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 their communities so you know I think going off of that approach really getting into the local level uh, leveraging the traditional leaders you know Dr. Okibo again you're correct about sort of the, the corrupted, uh, corruption already affecting um, um, uh, these leaders at the local level, but not sort of uh, it being you know, doom and gloom, um, leveraging um, their, the, the trust uh, that the villagers and these local people have um, of their leaders uh, to be able to then sort of go from sort of the bottom to the top approach as opposed to the top to bottom, bottom approach um, of, of solving these issues. I don't know if uh, Thank you, anyone else wants to. Anyone? I'm going to take one more comment, and then I want to turn to Richard again. For anyone? I, I think um, I was just going to say to Sunny before you leave. Um, you were talking about academia <laughs> being in charge of positions. Just to remind you that Professor Mahmoud Yakubu was a graduate of Oxford and Cambridge University. The former chief of staff of Nigeria was a graduate of Cambridge University. The person who wrote the 5,000 Naira program to help um, market women under Osibanjo, which was basically a political move, was a graduate of Harvard University, and all of this. And it comes back to my point of what exactly is education? Mm -hmm. Is it about reading some economic textbook and some template, or is it about really understanding the problem on the ground? Um, but I just wanted to remind you in case um, Femi Fanny Kaede is a graduate of Cambridge University as well. Um, just, to, just to remind everyone in the room for the avoidance of the doubt. And I, I think for me, again, it's also a charge to everyone in this room who is from um, these various countries that are challenged to, to say, look, when you go back to your countries making policies, please always remember that it's not just about what you read in the classroom. It's about the problems on the ground. And I think that that's absolutely critical. And again, just speaking to what the person said about African countries asking each other questions, and also just tying that in with what you said about structural adjustments. Um, the solution, again, I insist, is not going to come from the US. It's not even going to come from this hall. 
It's going to come from the, the, the creeks. It's going to come from Oshodi. It's going to come from Lome. It's going to come from Accra. It's going to come from all of those places. And what we need to do is to listen to these people and to understand exactly who, who says that GDP per capita is supposed to be the right judgment for, for development in, 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 um, in Kaduna. So, so these are some of the issues that we need to all begin to really look into. And then speaking about the issues of um, contested elections and non-contested elections, again, that's where institutions like this should come into play. Um, you said something about Professor Wale. I know very well that Wale is a very good friend to all of the Nigerian top politicians. And again, it brings me to the question of how well do our academics speak to this political power? It's one thing for me if I'm a friend to Mahmoud Yakubu to tell him, look, this election you conducted, there are a lot of questions. You need to come and speak to the people and answer these questions. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I will continue doubting whatever it is, the system that is in place. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where we need to actually get these things going. Yeah. And if there are any people in this room that have got some of these networks, please let us push them. Let's not be complicit because they are our friends, because they are our family. And, and let's not just keep it happening in, in rooms like this and we just talk and everybody goes home. Mm -hmm. These are people that you can hold and say, look, your actions causing the deaths of some people. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and wrap up a little bit later, but Richard, I'm going to hand back to you because you have one All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. He says one. You see, Miles is ever hopeful. Um, all right, so let me just, uh, you know, they're just so, first of all, this has been just so refreshing, uh, you know, that we, we've been all on the same page and it's the same page of talking about the real issues, the real problems. I mean, we're in an academic institution, but you know, I just love this. This is just this is this is just music symphonic to my ears. <laughs> all right, um, and uh, and first of all, and uh, you know, the the person who spoke and asked of you know, it seems to be so much about one about one country. But you know, <laughs> there's a Nigerian. We we say Nigerian factor. We mean one thing, but it's also Nigerian <laughs> factor meaning something else. Is this the way the imperial system created this entity? But anyway, no. But we, you know, the idea is is about a, a colloquium on Africa that the warden has in mind. And in fact, just when it was it today, yesterday, we were talking about nodes of progress, different parts of the continent. But don't matter. We will be getting around to exactly the point you're making. All right, I want to, and I'm very glad that, um, you know, this, I, I hope it's, it's, you know, the, web, the webcast is going to be available online. I know that I want to listen to it. I've been furiously taking as many notes as I can and having to be able to do it. But let me just, I just want to say a few words um, about, you know, what I call the ARIMA project in terms of, you know, my specific, okay, what am I going to do in the, you know, the years that, you know, divinity or whoever it is is going to allow me to be active. And very quickly... Uh, there are five points. And by the way, I, I talked about, you all have used this term. There's a notion of what I call engaged scholarship, and which people have been talking about. And I want to call again to you know, Elizabeth Hodgkin in terms of her family tradition, Thomas Hodgkin in terms of extramural education. I remember her mother, big Nobel Prize winner, Order of Merit, and remember her with her students. Uh, from India, for China, and so on, part of that. And she's continuing that tradition. She has her own program dealing with a high school in South Sudan, where she worked and is continuing. She just let you know there are people here who are deliberately involved. OK, so with the ARIMA project, there are five points. ARIMA is where I was born in Trinidad. And it also stands for an Africa Reimagined. Um, and so uh, the five aspects of it, first of all, my archives. I have extensive archives and making those archives available uh, for conventional use, as you know. But also now, I've spent the last number of uh, weeks uh, following everything on generative artificial intelligence. And earlier drafts have it. So just to let you know um, that digitization and so on is really opening up some tremendous opportunities here. The second is books. Um, I have um, some books. Uh, you know, that I intend to um, hope to write, and I have to make the space and time to do it. 
Um, one of them has been added to my second book on Nigeria, Long Promise, all right? My work having to do um, with having worked with former President Carter, something I need to do. I have to complete my Cameroon work on re responses to that. And I've added one that is going to be done um, having to do with Africa reimagined because I realize I've been doing this all of most of my academic life and being able to pull that together. Um, then there are uh, chronicles. You all have heard some. I like what you're talking about storytelling here and the role of it. And I didn't realize how much I told stories. If you go to Africa CLI, you'd have one of my students, they taped themselves and he said, oh, Professor Joseph is such a storyteller. Have him tell you about how that photograph with Nelson Mandela was taken. Well, anyway, I suddenly realized I do tell a lot of stories. And it's time to start writing some of those down. So anyway, um, the, the Chronicles. And then design. Thank you all very much for picking it up. In fact, when I gave my keynote address uh, for the Ibadan School of Government and Public Policy, I spent some time, I got in touch with this uh, divine design school at Stanford University. And I started reading the material. And I said, well, would you be willing to work on a project having to do with the redesign of, of Nigeria? Because I didn't have the money, the structure to do it. But anyway, now I think the opportunity for us to really work on design issues in a comparative way and bring in a lot of these experiences all over the continent. Right? And we have those institutes. We have Ashesi University. We have those, you know, speak on. All right, and then the final point, you know, I have A, B, C, D, and E because I'm used to teaching, and that helps students get really get it. And so E, there are three E's, uh, uh, enterprise, I'm sorry, education, enterprise, and efficacy. And in fact, when I was appointed to be a, a non-resident uh, fellow, um, of the Brookings Institution some years ago, and they were come, come with, coming up with an Africa growth notion. And I worked, spent some time you know, drafting a project I was calling you know, the acceleration of the creation of enterprise societies. And uh, anyway, it wasn't taken up, otherwise it would be existing. But you know, th th things come back around. Yeah. And so education, obviously, and I'd love to hear about the, the way in which you're, you're able to teach children because you know, and even Christoph, when he went to Mississippi, he said, you know, racism and poverty doesn't have to be an impediment to children learning and that their standards are going up. All right, so education, obviously enterprise. Yeah. We are an enterprising people. I mean, you know, no question. And then finally, efficacy. I mean, it's a word I've come up with because we knew, and Patrick, of course, you could speak to that in a different way. We need governments, institutions that can actually do what they were intended to do. And I now use the word efficacy as something that we can do. So anyway, so folks, stay tuned. That is going to be my personal, you. Uh, you know, before I go riding off into the sunset. Well, you're not, gonna, you're not going to go riding <laughs> off for a long time, Richard. Um, so uh, that, I think, concludes our session. And uh, I think that we've had some important reflections. Mm. Um, the first is about universities, we kept coming back to it, mm. and whether there's a way of reimagining or reinventing those, and maybe the market um, does have a role. Mm. I don't see why it shouldn't at a certain stage in, in the economic development of a country. Secondly, that if we do have better universities, the education has to be very practical mm. and has to be designed for the needs of the countries in which those universities are operating, mm. and it has to recognise problems on the ground and seek to uh, create solutions for those um, problems. Mm. Third, those solutions need to be African solutions and not solutions imported from outside or, mm. or templated. And there are some bright spots. Um, you talked about renewables. I think digital is also a, a bright spot. And, and there are others. Fourthly, um, very different from the China model, the SME sector is, is a source of, 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 of generation of... Um, of, of, of uh, wealth and, and reinvestable wealth. And we heard about entrepreneurship uh, and the significance of that. Um, we heard about female representation and, and the importance of that, and not just representation, but evolving representation into leadership. Mm. Um, we heard that um, uh, there are many and legion issues relating to governance, um, uh, um, but maybe um, there are grassroots ways of re-engaging people, um, either in traditional or semi-traditional models. Mm. Um, we heard quite validly that there needs to be more sharing um, between the um, 50 
um, four, 54 countries um, of, uh, of, of Africa. Um, and uh, I'm sure that is really, really important. And it really relates in a way to your last um, intervention, Richard, to the ARIMA project, um, because uh, that is an example of a, a catalyst for engaged scholarship. Uh, and uh, I um, particularly think it would be important for it to capture, I think, what you call those nodal points of optimism or the bright spots, which uh, Patrick mentioned, uh, capture them and share them. And, I, and, and certainly design resonates for me. Um, I don't think it has to be designing a template. Mm. I think if you went to the, you went to the Platner School of Design at Stanford, did you, um, when you went to Stanford? Well, they, 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 they um, concentrate on the processes of design. Mm. And I think it's those processes which are important, exactly. not providing templates which are then delivered. Mm. So um, for me, those were, were um, eight or nine, eight um, you know, very interesting thoughts. And I hope you all have similar thoughts and that you've enjoyed being here. Um, I would now like you really to give a huge round of applause to our contributors, to Patrick and, and the others. Um, and now you'll be glad to know that drinks are being served downstairs in the front quad. Please have a drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.